This is René Descartes. He, along with other great minds like Isaac Newton, originally called this number the imaginary number. But why is it imaginary and why do we need it? Let's approach this by looking at some simple quadratic equations. To solve them for x, we usually factorise them, then set them equal to zero to find their roots. In this case, there is only one root, minus one. You can see this easily on the graph of this equation. It only touches the x-axis at one point, minus one. But what if we cannot factorise a quadratic using real numbers? This was the problem that historical mathematicians had, because they only used real numbers like fractions, negative numbers and positive numbers. So in a case like this, we would say that the equation has no real roots. And you can see this on the graph, because the curve doesn't touch the x-axis. But what if we try another approach? We can use the quadratic formula to find what x should be. In this case, the coefficients of each term are each 1, and we can easily substitute these into the formula and solve for x. After a little bit of simplification, we will find a small problem. We need to find the square root of minus 3. But how can this be possible? A squared real number is always positive. Well, let's factorise this square root and see what we can do. We can factor out the square root of 3, and we are happy with this because this is a real number. The simplest part that we cannot deal with is the square root of minus 1. So what if, for now, we just ignore it a little and assign it to an algebraic symbol? We will call this symbol i. Historically, this was called the imaginary number because it wasn't a real number, and some people thought that it really was imaginary. Nowadays, these types of numbers are widely accepted and they're called complex numbers. Substituting this back in, we can go ahead and continue as normal with the quadratic formula and see what happens. We now have two values of x. Both have a normal looking part, but both have a strange part which is multiplied by this imaginary number, i. If we put these in brackets with x, these should be the factors of our original equation. And sure enough, if you expand these brackets, including our imaginary terms, the result is the original function which only produces real numbers. That is, y is always a real number. This was an example of the quadratic equation, and while you can find complex or imaginary roots using this method, the imaginary unit i is actually more useful for cubic equations. Historically, Cubic equations were solved using Cardano's formula, whereby you would simplify the cubic equation and then use this large expression underneath to find the values of x. The problem, however, was that the parts circled in red could cause the square roots to be negative, and even though the roots of the cubics didn't have any complex or imaginary values, they were real numbers, and this was a big problem at the time. They needed to use imaginary numbers as a middle step in order to reach the real solutions at the end. Ultimately, imaginary numbers were widely accepted. They were very useful in wave calculations, in things like electronic engineering and quantum theory, and the whole field of complex analysis was formed. If you're still watching at this point, thank you for watching. And if you're struggling with maths, check the description below for details on contacting me for one-on-one -on -one tutoring.